Welcome once again to another lecture. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, the process of making gametes and meiosis. But let's first start with a little scenario here. Let's assume that we're going to talk about Jack and Jill. So Jack and Jill met. They want to get married. They both found out they're from the same kind of region, the same area of the country. And, you know, they're in love. They want to get married. Jack's parents are Donald, and uh, we didn't put a name for Jack's mom, but it doesn't matter, Jack's mom. And Dave and Jill's parent, uh, parents are um, unknown from the father and Daisy as the, as the mom. And the reason that the father is unknown is because the father actually was simply just the sperm came from a donation center, right? So um, as as Jack and Jill are getting to know each other, Donald hears that Jill's father is unknown and that came from a donation center. It turns out he found out which donation center the sperm came from, and it was a, a donation center where Donald had actually contributed sperm earlier on. And so Donald is now worried that perhaps he might have been the, do the donor for the sperm that created Jill. So this is the conundrum that they're in, right? So Donald and Jack have talked about this, but Jack um, has doesn't want to like you know invade on Jill and Jill's mother's Daisy's privacy. So he's not willing at this point to go and say we need to take a uh, you know a, a paternity test and you know let's go in and because to do that you have to give DNA up, so you have to give a biological sample somehow. So Jack's not willing to do that. He wants to try to figure out. Is there a way to rule out that Donald is the father of Jill and never produced the sperm that then created Jill? And luckily, he knows a little bit about genetics, and so that's what we're going to kind of go on a path of discovery with him about genetics. So how can you determine if Donald is the father without doing DNA testing on Jill or Daisy? Well, there's lots of characteristics that are, that are passed on from parent and mo from the parent to the offspring and and some of these that I'm sure that you've heard of before things like blood types is genetic genetic diseases are genetic and they're inherited from parents to offspring then there's also a, a, a bunch of different simple morphological traits even in humans that are passed on in a very simple inheritance pattern from parents to offspring things like the widow's peak right where the hair comes to a point uh, the earlobe shape, whether it's attached or unattached, freckles. Um, there's other characteristics that also are, are, are passed on in a very simple way. So, so um, Jack could potentially start to look at a suite of these different ca characteristics in order to start to um, rule out or, or potentially he might look at a bunch and it might you know, continue to support the idea that, that Donald is indeed the father. So. So let's, let's figure out how um, he might reason through this. So um, what we're going to do is look at the chromosomes from both Donald and Daisy. Okay, so we're just going to look, though, at only four, pair, four of the pairs of chromosomes. Here, here below we have what's called a, a karyotype. And so here you can see all 23 pairs. One, two, three, four, five. And they have these stained banding patterns, which we talked of, have talked about before, but this is an, a crude representation of the underlying genetic code, right? So the genes that are found on both of these homologous pairs of chromosomes are found in the same place on each homologous pair of chromosome in the same order. And you can see that the chromosomes get um, gradually smaller as you work your way down. So chromosome, you know, pair number 22 are, are very small. This is representing a male because there's a X and a Y. Notice the Y is about a third the size of the X chromosome. So if we come back to these cartoons up here, we can see, you know, Donald's chromosomes, but we're only going to look at these four pairs of chromosomes, 1, 9, 16, and then he has an X and a Y. And then, of course, Daisy has 1, 9, and 16, and then she has two X's because she's a girl. So in order to produce a gamete, um, the, the sperm are produced in the testes and the eggs are produced in the ovaries. And we need to, to know something about a couple terms here, that all of the cells in the adult of Jack and Jill are what are called diploid cells, and they all have 
46 pairs of chromosomes, or I'm sorry, 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total number of 46 chromosomes. However, after gametes are produced, the gametes only have 23 chromosomes. They don't have 23 pairs of chromosomes. They only each have 23 chromosomes. And then when these two come back together again, when an egg and a sperm come together again in the process of fertilization, you once again now have an, uh, a cell that has 46 chromosomes. Now we sometimes refer to this also as diploid and haploid cells. So diploid cells are these cells that have the 2n, so paired 23 pairs of chromosomes, 23 times 2 equals 46. And a haploid cell only has an n number, so it only has the number of chromosomes, 23. When it comes back together again in fertilization, it becomes 2n again, so 2n equals 46, because 2 times 23 equals 46. So let's come back to Donald's chromosomes. If we're thinking about what types of sperm can Donald produce, right? And we're just going to look at these four pair, these four chromo, these these four um, pairs of chromosomes. The way that you have to think about this is, is okay. Donald can give either the version that came from his mother, this pink version, or the version that came from Donald's father, right? So he can either give this chromosome number one or this chromosome number one. So let's say that he gives the, the pink version. Then he can either give either this chromosome nine or this chromosome nine. Let's say he gives it once again the pink version. Same thing for the chromosome 16s. He gives the pink version. And then for, let's say for the sex chromosomes, he ends up giving the X chromosome, wh who, which he got from his mother. So his Sperm, then, at least for these four chromosomes, would be the pink version of 1, 9, 16, and then chromosome X. Alternatively, though, he could have got, he could, Donald could produce a sperm that has chromosome number 1 blue, chromosome one, number 9 pink, chromosome number 16 pink, and the Y chromosome, which he got from his father. And so his, this sperm would have this version of chromosomes, right? Now, there's, as, we, as we do this, you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, there's lots of other combinations. For example, here's some of the other potential combinations, right? A pink 1, a blue 9, a pink 16, and the X chromosome. Or we come down here, a blue 1, a pink 9, a blue 16, and the Y chromosome, and so forth. And there's lots of other potential combinations. What can't happen, though, is this. You can't get a sperm that has both number one chromosomes. You can't get a sperm that also is going to contribute both the X and the Y. So you can't ha you can't end up with a bit with a pink number one and a blue number one and a X and a Y in a sperm and then not have any of the chromosomes that were from the the nine pair and the sixteen pair. That just doesn't happen. So. Every sperm is only going to get one of each of the paired chromosomes.